Welcome everybody uh, to this wonderful webinar. Today is Don't Go There. If you are helping a client buy or sell properties that are not in your, in your normal service area, you want to be here for this webinar because this is going to be best practices. And uh, we have a great cast here for you. We have from Maryland Realtors, Kathleen D'Artez, our Director of Legal Affairs, Colette Massengel, our Director of Professional Development and Member Engagement, and two wonderful special guests, Carol Williams from Samson Properties and Renee Galicia from Bright MLS. So without further ado, let's turn it over to one of our hosts, Kathleen. Kathleen, please take it from here. Great, thank you, Dan. And thanks to everybody for joining us. Uh, we are excited to have you with us and hopefully uh, we'll go through some good material and provide good information and get some good questions. Um, the, the panelists we have, I'm just gonna introduce briefly just Carol Williams. Um, we are gonna go through some content and a part of our discussion is gonna be from the broker's perspective and what are best practices from the broker's perspective and for agents. And Kara is the broker um, for Samson Properties in DC and, uh, excuse me, in Maryland and Pennsylvania, excuse me, uh, 11 offices and about 2000 or so agents in Maryland. So she has handled a lot of transactions and answered a lot of questions. So uh, she's gonna provide the broker's perspective. I will, let me pull up the slide deck and I can show you who's going to talk about what. How about we do that? <laughs> that should, all right, let me start this. Hopefully, oh, that's the last slide. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> let me pause. Colette, maybe you should start for a second. Oh, sure. I'm, I can um, introduce uh, our other esteemed panelists, Renee Galicia. Uh, he is the EVP for Customer Advocacy at Bright MLS. Uh, Renee joined the team. Uh, Bright MLS has 95, I didn't realize not, that uh, Bright MLS has 95,000 real estate professionals. Uh, Mr. Galicia has over 20 years of customer advocacy uh, experience in the real estate industry. Uh, he previously served in a leadership position at the National Association of Realtors and the California Regional MLS. While at NAR, Mr. Galicia served as liaison to the Council of Multiple List Services and the Real Estate Standards Organization. So we are proud uh, to have both of our panelists with us today, Kara Williams and Mr. Renee Galicia. All right, so I think I can start sharing my screen now. Looks good. All right, good. Good, thank you. <laughs> Sorry for the glitch. All right, uh, this uh, slide here is this is our agenda, basically our outline for what we are going to talk about today. Uh, first, we're just going to sort of outline the topic in general, the questions that we're receiving on the legal hotline, questions that we're hearing from brokers, uh, questions that we're being asked as we teach CE classes, um, and then uh, we're going to go through what Maryland law is. Uh, the Code of Ethics and the Brokers Act have some uh, relevant provisions, so we'll discuss those. We're going to talk also about pathways to professionalism that's from NAR and there are some specific uh, suggestions or recommendations in there that would apply to this kind of situation. Uh, Colette's going to briefly go over the NAR code of ethics and some uh, relevant sections of that. Uh, Renee is going to give us some great content from Bright MLS. There are some things you can do and some things you cannot do. <laughs> so Renee is going to provide some guidance on that. And then Kara will uh, wrap it up for us from the broker's perspective again uh, as a broker and uh, what guidance you would give to an agent in a situation uh, where they're servicing an area or representing a client outside their normal service area. So essentially what the topic is, the issue that's been presented to us or why we're doing this, this uh, webinar, um, it's, it's, I guess, two issues really. One would be geography. The situation that, that we've been asked about frequently, it comes from agents who are with the Coastal Association of Realtors or Midshore Board, sort of on the Eastern Shore of Maryland and um, agents in Garrett County as well. Uh, largely the Coastal Association in Garrett County, areas where there are you know, resort areas or where people are buying second homes. And the situation that they are facing is oftentimes a property is listed for sale there. And there might be an agent from another part of the state. I live in Baltimore City, so I'll say Baltimore City. I'm not picking on my Baltimore City people by any means. I'm just using that as an example. But an agent from Baltimore City represents a buyer who wants to purchase a condo in Ocean City. 
And the, the challenge that the folks in Ocean City are facing is if the Baltimore City agent is not able to or is not willing to drive the client to Ocean City, is not able or willing to show that property to the buyer, they're going to ask the listing agent to show the property. Uh, they may not be able to go for the home inspection or not be willing to go for the home inspection. They're going to ask somebody else to meet the home inspector, right? So that's sort of the challenge from, from the, you know, the resort areas are seeing that. And I guess the other issue of the challenge down here is the, the third bullet point. You're the listing agent. What do you do? You know, you, the buyer's agent doesn't want to show the property to the buyer. You're being asked to show the property. You're being asked to make these appointments, meet inspectors, et cetera. What do you do? How do you handle that? And some of the things that we're seeing, we're seeing some comments that are made in the agent remarks section on Bright MLS trying to adjust or modify the compensation that's offered. So that's, Renee's going to focus on that. But that's, that's basically what the issue is, what we're seeing, the kind of questions that we're being asked. So um, I guess we'll go ahead and get started then. We'll start with Maryland law first. And essentially, just think about this. If you're representing a client, you know you're back to your pre-licensing class. What's your uh, you owe a fiduciary duty to your client, right? The standard of care that you owe to your client. You have to put your client's interest ahead of your own. You have to protect and promote your client's best interest. So that's always what the standard of care is. And the challenge, I guess, let's talk about it from a buyer's agent's perspective. If I'm the buyer's agent, my buyer wants to purchase property in Ocean City. If I don't go to Ocean City with my buyer, if I don't show the property to the buyer, if I haven't seen the property and I put an offer in, Am I adequately representing my client? Am I adequately protecting and promoting my client's interest? Um, another issue that could be raised also is uh, from the code of ethics, um, your duties to the public. Um, are you informed on the current market conditions in Ocean City or the Garrett County? Do you know all of the, uh, you know, what, what the uh, properties have sold for in that area? Are you familiar with the nuances of, you know, the distinction between this condo and the other condo that was in the same building, uh, that, you know, why a, a different offer, a different number might make more sense. Uh, you know, again, if without that knowledge, without that market knowledge or knowledge of the market conditions, are you adequately representing your client's interest? Um, the other, the third bullet point up here, the third uh, reference up here, the code section, um, again, refers to protecting and promoting your client's best interest and again, not just uh, understanding market conditions, but specifically statutes, laws, legislation in that area, in that jurisdiction, in Ocean City, in Garrett County. Are there specific addenda that need to be used? Are there specific notices that need to be uh, you know, provided to the buyer in those kind of situations? Are you as the agent familiar with that? Do you have the knowledge to make sure that you're getting all of the information that would be relevant to your buyer? Um, and just, I guess, as a, a side note or additional information, I know everybody has taken the uh, brokerage relationship class. That's required, right? Um, Colette, see Colette nodding her head. <laughs> We've kind of memorized that class by now, I think. But um, the Maryland Real Estate Commission in that class specifically, there's one of uh, the FAQs that the Real Estate Commission prepared. And the question was asked, it was a in that situation, I think it was a buyer who had not seen the property. And the question was, if I am the agent, do I need to see the property? You know, the buyer wants to purchase it sight unseen. I also have not seen the property. Do I need to see it before submitting an offer? And the Real Estate Commission answered that FAQ and was pretty clear with it. I printed it out so I could read it. Um, the first sentence, you are at risk of being accused of failure to provide reasonable care. This is especially true for homes where showing access is an option. While pictures provide a great deal of information, there may be additional considerations or problems which you should raise with your client and which may impact the type of offer written or addenda included. So that's really, that's the Maryland Real Estate Commission's perspective. And I think that's a pretty clear um, response to what their, their perspective is on what your obligations are uh, to showing the property and physically being at the property uh, before submitting an offer. Uh, the only other thing I can think of from the Real Estate Commission's perspective, there have been a couple cases where licensees were disciplined 
and it involved um, showing properties or providing access to properties where the agent was not physically present. And I, you know, Kara can talk about this a little more uh, from the practical perspective, but it, I think one of them was a situation where the agent, the buyer's agent, something happened, they were stuck in traffic or whatever. I don't know what the issue was, but for some reason they were not going to be able to meet the buyer at the property you know, at the scheduled appointment time. The buyer provided the, the, the code, I think the, the showing code provided that to the buyer in an email. <laughs> so the buyer went into the property unaccompanied by any licensee. The buyer went into the property by themselves and wandered around by themselves. And in that case, I don't know all of the details. We just see what's published. But the buyer actually filed a complaint against their list, their buyer's agent, excuse me. The buyer filed a complaint against the agent who had provided them with the code. And the agent was found in violation of the Maryland Code of Ethics. So um, that uh, is a situation that should not happen. And again, well, there's a lot of things that come into play here, but just be aware of what the Real Estate Commission's perspective is and be aware also that the Real Estate Commission does uh, uh, discipline people for this, this type of conduct or this type of infraction. Was Colette or anybody else, did you wanna add anything before we move on? No, I think that's um, that gives a, a good kind of outline of, of what Maryland law's guidance is with regard to this issue, so. Okay, all right, let's move to the next one. I think uh, pathways to professionalism, more guidance. Colette, you wanna? Yeah, so much of what I'm gonna talk about is really kind of just echoing what Kathleen has already said uh, from the standpoint of the guidance that's been issued by the National Association of Realtors. Um, and so we start with pathways to professionalism. And as you all know, there are three different sort of sort of parts to the pathways to professionalism. Uh, one of them deals with respect to the public. Uh, the other one deals with respect for property. And that's the one uh, we're going to focus on today. And then, of course, there's respect uh, for peers. Uh, but this these pathways to professionalism, uh, we, we do our best to emphasize them uh, here in, in, in the ethics classes and so forth, because if you follow these sort of uh, basic kind of common sense uh, sort of rules, uh, then you, you are likely to minimize uh, your chances of, of opening yourself up to uh, a violation, a potential violation of the NAR Code of Ethics. So uh, it is the pathway to professionalism. It's the pathway to keeping you out of <laughs> a realtor jail and uh, going through that whole uh, unfortunate process. So I wanted to focus on just a couple of points that are spelled out in Pathways to Professionalism that we believe are applicable uh, in this, you know, in terms of addressing these issues that Kathleen has done a great job of sort of outlining today. So the first one um, is be responsible for everyone that you allow to enter the listed property. Uh, so, I mean, again, these are very sort of common sense types of things, but always good to uh, be mindful of them and to have them really in the forefront of your mind anytime uh, you are going into a listed property, be responsible for everyone that you allow to enter into the property. Um, so the second one, never allow buyers to enter listed property unaccompanied, right? Uh, that is a huge no-no. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, you're there you know, to answer questions. And at the end of the day, uh, and I'll get into this a little bit in the discussion on the relevant uh, articles of the NAR Code of Ethics, at the end of the day, everything that you're doing or a good, a good a portion of what you're doing um, and why you're doing it is to, is to protect and, and promote your client's interest. Uh, so you want to make sure uh, that you're there, you're able to answer questions, uh, that you're protecting you know, uh, the, the property and, and the listing and making sure that nothing uh, is going wrong there. Um, when showing the property, keep all members of the group together. Uh, that's also, again, kind of a common sense, but make sure that uh, nobody kind of wanders off into an area um, and uh, something happens there. Uh, never allow unaccompanied access to the property without permission. Really critical there. Uh, and we'll go into some more discussion about that uh, when we talk about Article 1 uh, and uh, standard of practice. 1-16, uh, I believe it is. So never allow unaccompanied access to the property without permission, and then enter the property, enter the property only with permission 
um, even if you have the lockbox key or combination. So uh, those I think are key points, um, straightforward. Uh, anything, anybody wanna add Kathleen or, or Kara or Renee to, to this part of the conversation? I just going to add a minor point. Uh, NAR is, is updating the pathways to professionalism, and I would suspect the lockbox key or combination might be updated. <laughs> the verbiage right. might be updated there a little bit, but the concept is still the same. That's right. So now we can, I guess, move forward and just talk about some of, some of the relevant articles of the NAR Code of Ethics, some specifically Article 1, uh, which obligates realtors to protect and promote the client's interest. Uh, that is first and foremost. So think about that. If you're representing a buyer and you're not able to accompany, accompany them to, uh, you know, Deep Creek or wherever they're looking at uh, property, um, just think about that in terms of what your obligations are in, in protecting their interest and making sure that you're doing the utmost uh, to, to protect it. Um, specifically, if you look at standard of practice 1-16, we think that's um, instructive here. Realtors shall not access or use or permit or enable others to access, use, list, use listed or managed property on terms or conditions other than those authorized by the owner or seller. So at the end of the day, uh, you don't want to be doing anything with respect to the property that this seller or owner of the property has not authorized you to do, whether that's showing or whatever other, uh, in whatever other capacity um, you're dealing with the property. You, you, the, the seller's direction uh, is what is controlling, and that's what uh, you want to make sure that, that you're doing. So anything to add there as far as Article 1? from the panel. Hey, Colette, I was going to ask a question. So uh, enabling others to use or access the property, let's just say hypothetically, um, a uh, home inspector, property inspection, would, uh, if the seller has said that uh, they want everyone to be accompanied by a licensee uh, when they're showing the property or accessing the property, would it be appropriate to provide a one-day showing code to a home inspector? Not if the seller has asked or has directed that anybody that comes into the property be accompanied by a licensee. That's just a hypothetical situation there, Colette, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So yeah, the seller's instructions are really key um, uh, and you absolutely want to follow them. Right. Colette, if I can uh, just add, uh, uh, respective or regarding the uh, access to properties and, and lockbox use and whatnot, um, any misuse or, or you know, sharing of keys obviously is, is discouraged and not allowed, uh, but enforcement issues or complaints regarding lockbox, key access, um, anything related to that would be managed and handled by the local association of the respective, uh, uh, either the key holder or the lockbox uh, holder, uh, depending on where their membership stands. So uh, some of this wouldn't be handled at the MLS level, but certainly uh, code of ethics issues and lockbox key and access issues are handled and managed by the associations as well. Yeah, I was just going to second that they're in uh, across the local associations. Um, they're, they're not the same rules either. So if you're not familiar with the rules in that that area or not a member of that local board, they might not be the same as uh, where you're located. Two excellent points to add to that uh, conversation. So thank you, Renee. Thank you, Kara. Anything else, Kathleen? You have anything to add? No, that's it. All right. All right, so then the other, we think, uh, relevant article uh, in play here is Article 11. Uh, and as you all know, uh, Article 11 says that the services that with, with which realtors provide to their clients and customers shall conform, so shall, we mean must, right, must conform to the standards of practice and competence, right, uh, which are reasonably expected in the specific real estate disciplines in which the realtor is engaged. So uh, to the point that Kathleen made a little bit earlier, if you are generally servicing, I don't know, Baltimore City or let's say Montgomery County, uh, and you've got a buyer client who wants to uh, look at some properties and purchase some properties in uh, 
Ocean City or or Midshore, uh, then you have to ask yourself, you know, are, are you familiar with the disclosures in that area? Do you know the laws? Do you know the requirements? Are you familiar with the forms? Can you can you provide uh, competent service uh, to your client uh, in, in those instances? So that's why we think um, Article 11 comes into play in this scenario as well. All right, anything else, uh, uh, Kara or Kathleen or Renee to add with regard to Article 11? I think you covered it all, Colette. Yeah, that was good. So we, so Kathleen is, uh, our, our portion of this, I think we really kind of mirror, as you can see, she uh, spoke quite a bit about Maryland law and what the requirements are there. And, and as you can see, uh, with the discussion from me on the NAR Code of Ethics, uh, a lot of the guidance, the requirements mirror each other in this in this regard. So, um, I think we can turn it over uh, now to uh, to Renee to talk a little bit about Bright. Really, really important part of the conversation here. So, thank you, Renee, for joining us. Absolutely, thank you. And uh, just a couple of areas that I want to touch on uh, regarding you know out of area transactions and and how you manage that. Um, I'll, I'll start, I'll kind of take the long path through this. Um, and I'll start with uh, rule 1.1 1 .1, and, and that just covers participation in the MLS, how someone gets access to the MLS, right? Uh, with, within Bright, we're, we're tasked with managing uh, the collection of listing information, maintaining its, its accuracy and sending that out or transmitting it to other participants or other subscribers. So to participate in the MLS, uh, all that's required is that you're licensed in the state. So within our service area, so it could be in, in Maryland, Virginia, whichever state you're you're practicing in, um, and then you have to actively endeavor to list or sell property. And then there's also categories for appraisers, uh, assistants, et cetera. But in terms of participation within the MLS, uh, recognizing that you're licensed generally in the state that you're practicing, I say generally, you know, we have a wide footprint, but you're licensed in the state that you're practicing, uh, you're licensed by the state. So you're not licensed by a zip code or a community, uh, you're licensed in the state. So when we look at our participation rule, as long as you're licensed, and you're actively endeavoring to, to list or sell property, make offers or accept offers of cooperation and compensation, that's how you get access to the MLS. Now, in terms of the offers of compensation, um, this is where we see this issue primarily present itself, uh, where there are potentially some violations that could occur on behalf of the listing broker. As you know, uh, the offer of, of compensation when, within the MLS is a unilateral offer as distinguished from a bilateral. So bilateral, you know, you 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 agree uh, uh, on whatever the term is, you know, have some negotiation and you agree. On a unilateral offer, it's, you know, here's offer compensation for uh, another broker to bring a ready, willing, and able buyer uh, with to bring an offer on the terms acceptable as listed. Um, so it's a procuring cause analysis on the offer compensation. And so where we see things go sideways here uh, within the MLS, is when there are conditions attached uh, or restrictions attached to the offer of compensation. Again, the offer of compensation is unconditional and unilateral as required by the rules within the MLS. It's not to say that you can't have negotiations outside of the MLS you know, uh, direct and turn this into a bilateral agreement, but in terms of the offer in the MLS, you can't attach conditions such as um, the offer of compensation will be reduced or increased or whatever the case may be if you don't accompany your client. Um, that, that type of condition is not acceptable. It's not allowed within, within the rules. Um, and, and so here again, the focus is it has to be a unilateral offer because again, the offer compensation is for procuring cause, uh, bringing an offer on the terms uh, acceptable to the seller as listed. Um, in that same vein, uh, there's also some overlap into issues about showing or access to the property. Um, uh, showings and access have to be made available to all subscribers. So you can't, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to say, well, you're not, you don't have an office here in the, in the area. So uh, no, you can't show the property. Um, you might have some, some not just uh, MLS rule issues, but you could potentially have some other issues on the other side of uh, are you represent your client's interests and the like, but that, that would be a state license law issue or practice issue um, uh, addressed to your broker. Uh, and then I, I type it on my slide, I, I put in uh, uh, SOP or standard of practice, but within the MLS policy handbook, uh, there are various uh, MLS standards that you can point to. Uh, typically these mirror the code of ethics, uh, recognizing that not all MLS subscribers are realtor members. Uh, so one such example here uh, on one that mirrors uh, article 11 
is uh, standard 16.25, which talks about the level of service or your competency uh, on the service that you're providing your clients. That said, it's both sides, right? Representing a seller, representing a buyer. Um, and one thing that hasn't been mentioned on, on these other area issues, um, certainly there's an element about knowing the, the community, the area, uh, disclosures required, but there's also the element of you know, knowing the buyer, who knows the buyer best. And it's typically the buyer's broker, uh, what they're looking for, their use case scenarios, uh, what types of properties will work for them or not. And a lot of this, uh, and I, I mentioned this to, to say, a lot of this can still be addressed, addressed through the MLS, understanding that the MLS is at its core, a broker cooperative. So enabling you, uh, the brokers, uh, subscribers to cooperate with each other. Uh, if there's anything that's material to the property, uh, specific to disclosures, uh, inspections that are required, always a good idea, especially on the list side, to include that information on the listing itself. Uh, you have the ability to, if it's impact, impactful to consumers, you have the ability to include some information in the public remarks related to the description of the property, condition, et cetera, or if it's more transactional in nature, information you want to communicate to the other brokers, you can include that in the agent remarks as well. Again, don't lose sight that this is a broker cooperative working with each other and exchanging that information, providing some guidance would be helpful. Um, that said, uh, you know, whatever information, if you ever come across information that's missing, omitted, uh, incorrect on a listing, uh, you can always address those through our uh, compliance team, our accuracy and policy department uh, by, su by submitting a report to us and we can look into it as well. Uh, so covered quite a bit there. I'll, I'll pause and see if there's any questions or uh, if any of the panelists wanted to add anything further. Hey, Renee, I wanted to ask a question just, just to clarify. I, you know, I generally don't encourage people to report other people <laughs> and it's generally a, a stop snitching type of person. But um, at some point, I think if you're seeing someone doing this a lot and you know that someone, if they're putting, uh, say the listing agent is putting in uh, inappropriate things in the agent remarks about reducing the commission or making it conditional, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if I see that, would I report that to your compliance department? Is that the, the best course of action? Yes, that's correct. Um, a, a lot of what we do, and we process thousands of reports uh, every year, um, we rely on you to, uh, you know, you the subscribers, uh, and really anyone can submit a report on any listing. If you're within the MLS system, uh, looking at the listing, you'll see the bullseye icon on the listing. You can click on that and submit that report to us. Any report that we receive is handled confidentially. Uh, so we treat it as if it were anonymous. Um, while we may know who made the, the report, that's to enable us to respond and ask some additional questions if we need some more information uh, uh, to go through our enforcement process. But uh, we won't ever identify the reporting party to uh, the person that's being complained about. So feel free to submit those reports to us. You can call us, you can uh, email us as well. Uh, but hitting the uh, bullseye icon on the listing is the best way to report uh, any types of those issues or any other inaccuracy issues. Okay, so I'm the, I'm the listing agent. I receive a notice of violation. How much time do I have to correct that or fix that? Uh, generally, on most of our issues, we provide a, a three-day window uh, okay. to correct. Uh, again, we want to ensure that we have accurate listing information. We're not uh, oriented or focused on you know strictly finding uh, just for the sake of finding. We want clean, accurate data within the system that's compliant within the rules. Again, keeping in mind that the rules are you know by realtors for realtors. The, these are rules that that. Uh, originate uh, at a, as a national standard that are sent out to all MLSs across the country. So uh, we, we prefer uh, clean, accurate data rather than finding. So if you correct, if you receive a notice from us, very important to respond right away, um, get involved, have some dialogue or some communication with us. If you ignore it uh, and you're on the listing side and you don't take action on an issue, you will receive a fine after that. Okay. That's all I had. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? All right. No, I think that's good. All right. All right. Thanks, Renee. We can move yep. on now. Can we? Can Kathleen move the slide deck? Yes. <laughs> there we go. Kara, did you want to share some um, some thoughts from the broker's perspective? Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, and thank you for that great, uh, bright information, Renee. That was um, that was wonderful, especially um, like the the procuring cause uh, information as well. Um, so uh, you have to go back to the original example of you have a client, you, you work in Baltimore, you have a client who wants to um, purchase in Ocean City or an area where you aren't familiar with. Uh, what do you do? 
And ultimately, a lot of these scenarios that have been mentioned um, are boiling down to the, the buyer's agent leaning on somebody else to either let them in or uh, go against what their what their codes or rules or laws or um, ultimately just not uh, promoting their client's best interest. So how do we, uh, we have a decision to make. Um, I think that starting with your broker is a great idea. Uh, I'm sure that they've got some uh, something to address this in their policy and procedures manual. Um, so starting with them uh, is, a, is a great idea. Um, if you, if you are not familiar in that area um, and you are you got to uh, work in your client's best interest, uh, cooperating with other brokers, cooperating with other realtors, um, referring, um, creating relationships, uh, referring out the deal to somebody who is more is well versed in the area that knows the uh, the market conditions. Um, that is, that, that's a great idea. I think that, um, you know, those, and, and that goes both ways. So if you, you know, we're talking a lot about, um, looking into either deep Creek or ocean city or vacation areas, but if you start creating those relationships that can come back for you too. So those, those agents aren't necessarily well-versed in your area as well. And, um, and there's certainly lots of, uh, local, um, Local agenda, local laws, um, regional things that 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 um, agents should be aware of. Um, with that being said, I am all for as a you know a broker uh, perspective, growing in those areas. So if you are looking to grow in the in that area, um, if you're moving to that area, and um, want to grow your business in that area. Um, I'm all for that too. Just do it the right way, right? So make sure that we have, um, you can talk to your broker to see if they have an office in that area. Uh, they would have an office manager that is knowledgeable, um, that can provide mentor services, uh, hook up you know, hook up with a mentor, um, uh, join a local board, get access to those local form, uh, the local board forms. Um, you're also going to need to have access to those tools. So um, like this, we were talking about the central lack, uh, central lack access and um, knowing the, um, those right selections and right to fill out. Um, I think that, um, you know, yeah, joining a local board is also going to open up the education that you need. So um, a lot, a lot more resources, uh, classes and, um, yeah. You know avenues to to learn about the area. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, also, when you talk to your broker, they might have um, and we it hasn't hasn't been brought up yet, but E and O um, policies. So that might um, you know there might be something in your E and O insurance that would guide you to um, to what to what how to handle that situation as well. Um, let's see. I think that, um, and this, oh, and I wanted to also mention, it doesn't just go with, for, we've been talking a lot about buyers, representing buyers, representing sellers too. So if you have, um, you know, if, if you have clients that also own a home in those, one of those vacation areas and they want to list it, uh, it goes that way as well. So um, that's another area where knowing the market conditions and knowing what the, the nuances knowing the correct forms to fill out, having access to those forms, um, that would, it, uh, listing a home in a different area would also require um, having, having access to all of those things. Um, I think, uh, what else, what else? And also from a broker, broker perspective, we're looking out for you, for the agents as well. You know, we want to keep you out of real estate jail and keep you out of trouble. Uh, no one ever would want to, um, to have a client come back later and because of an issue and say that they weren't represented. Uh, so that's, um, you know, we, we're, we're looking out for your, your inter best interest as well. Kara, I was just going to say when you were talking about the seller that did you reminded me we did have a legal hotline question once the, the vast majority of them are involving buyers agents, mm -hmm. but we did have a question if it was a listing agent. Um, she was in Southern Maryland and a 
you know, one of her best friends who lived down in Southern Maryland, you know, same area, uh, the friend had a condo in Ocean City and wanted to sell the condo in Ocean City. So wanted her, her bestie from Southern Maryland to list her property for her and sell the condo in Ocean City. And the, uh, the woman called the legal hotline because she didn't really feel like she was the best person to do that. She, she yeah. recognized that she was more familiar with Southern Maryland. That's really where her, the, most of the properties, you know, the area that she serviced for the most part. She was with a small brokerage that did not have offices in Ocean City. She didn't have the, the sort of safety net that you were talking about, Kara. Um, so she did want to make a referral and just wanted to, you know, get more information on that. So that's a good point. I, we have been sort of talking about it from the buyer's agent perspective, but it could also be uh, all of these same concepts and same considerations could come into play for a listing agent as well. That's a really good point. Yeah. So unless, uh, unless you have, um, you, you've got those, uh, those resources um, and you can work with somebody and if you don't if you don't know the area if you if you can't let them in if you're going to be leaning on somebody that's not even representing you um, to let you in or or go attend the home inspection things like that um, I think you know definitely referring it out to somebody who um, somebody who knows the area is, is the way to go yeah, and I would just add to that um, with regard to referring it out, which I, I agree. Um, there is a fairly new, well, a couple of years now, Maryland Realtors Referral Agreement uh, that can be used to facilitate uh, whatever uh, you know arrangement that you want to make. So the tools are there uh, to to act in the client's best interest uh, and do the appropriate thing. Um, You've got the form there. Uh, make sure you fill it out correctly, uh, and that the managers or brokers on both sides sign it, uh, and then that becomes, uh, you know, binding document. So uh, referral may make the most sense in a lot of instances when you have the tool to negotiate what you want that referral agreement to look like. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, I think, oops, I'm going the wrong way. What am I doing? <laughs> All right, I think that was it as far as the slide deck. Do you guys want to start, see if we have some questions we want to answer? There are some questions. You have many. Yeah, we were looking, Dan, you, you said we have many. Yeah, you have them in the chat section in the Q&A box too. Um, uh, somebody wanted clarification from Bright LL MLS in the in the uh, in the Q and A box uh, about who can access Bright without being a realtor, government agencies, et cetera, things like that. I don't know if there's any clarification that needs to be on that. Um, yeah, I can take that, and I think that came up uh, when I was discussing uh, Standard uh, sixteen point two five, where uh, across the country there there's some MLSs that allow uh, uh, non realtor subscribers. Um, and, and so uh, standard 16.25 was put in place uh, so that there's some there's some application or mirror to the code of ethics and some applicability there. Um, uh, within Bright, you'll find uh, uh, you know realtor membership. Uh, with, with respect to the appraiser uh, members, so th those are, uh, and, and this is common to many MLSs across the country, uh, we do have, I'm sorry, not appraisers, um, government agencies, and then I'll address the appraiser. Uh, government agencies uh, do reach out regularly and ask for uh, uh, licensed data so that they can compile valuations of properties, uh, making sure that that assessments are accurate, uh, they're not overtaxing, et cetera. And so uh, we do provide access on, on very strict and limited license terms. Um, so they have ability to, to view that data and access it. Um, it, it, it there's a lot of constraints there. Um, won't go too deeper in, uh, other than just to say that uh, they're, they're limited just to viewing data that uh, will assist them in valuation. Uh, with respect to the appraisers, I uh, believe there's a question. Actually, I just lost it. It scrolled on me. There's a uh, lot of it, questions. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's um, a lot of uh, opinions on appraisers. I just was noticing that uh, is the lender appraiser familiar with the area? Are they geographically competent? Um, there's a huge difference between familiarity and knowledge. a lot of uh, strong feelings on appraisers. Sure. Yeah, and, 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 and there are a couple of questions uh, on a couple of topics on appraisers. I'll just say that we do have appraiser subscribers 
uh, within the MLS, um, like many other MLSs in the country. Um, and, and same thing on access to properties and the like, the rules apply to them as well, where uh, you know, they should be given access to the property. Uh, again, practice related issues, um, uh, not adhering to state license law, those would be uh, addressed through those respective uh, channels. Uh, code of ethics issues to the local association. In terms of MLS rules, uh, they are also subject to MLS rules um, on usage of data, access to property availability, showings, and the like. Okay. Yeah, there's some comments again. Just because you've taken a vacation in a certain area for a number of years doesn't mean you're familiar with the market conditions. All valid points. Very true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I see, yeah, the bro. Uh, was re I'll respond to the broker having an office in a specific location doesn't guarantee knowledge uh, of the agent. Uh, no, most certainly it was just a um, an avenue of um, of resources to provide a mentor if you're growing into that area, um, and um, or uh, or a referral provide a referral to somebody who somebody in that office who does know. Okay. Is there any other questions in the Q&A that were not answered? I'll take one more from uh, Robert. Uh, again, I think I, I confused folks with my, with my typo. Um, question about 16.25. 16.25 uh, that I referenced is not uh, part of the code of ethics. It's actually a standard within the MLS rules, uh, within NAR's MLS policy handbook. So if you go to NAR's website, access the uh, MLS policy handbook, there is a whole section devoted to standards many of which mirror the code of ethics. Uh, so 16.25 is not a code of ethics standard of practice, but rather its own standalone standard within the MLS rules, uh, model rules uh, at the NAR level. Hey, I have a, here's a question. I'm not sure what the answer is. Um, another thing that out of town agents would put an out of town lock box on a property, local board central lock wouldn't work. Is that accurate or is there? Yeah. It, it's possible, um, uh, and so we, we help capture that information. One of the things that we're working on at, at Bright, understand the disparities between you know different types of systems that can be used. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Y'all may have seen that we're working on a showing hub. So it's an internal database where we can plug in, uh, whether you're using Centralock or Supra or another system where uh, access information on showings, uh, availability, and, and opening up access to the properties can all be managed through a hub. Um, we're closer on the showing aspect of it. Uh, lockbox and, and key issues. Good thing to keep in mind, right? Identify those on the listing itself. Uh, if you uh, have some special sort of access or someone doesn't have a, a particular key, uh, there should be some information on how to manage through that. Um, folks will likely reach out to the listing broker uh, and that's where it's critical to have updated information within the listing itself. Yeah, you're also going to want to ch check the um, your century lock or whatever lockbox you have, your agreement, because um, those are different too. Um, um, among the different local local boards, um, and also ENO insurance. I'll plug that again. There's mm -hmm. stipulations with regards to lockboxes in a lot of your ENO insurance, so that's important for the agents to know. <clears throat> I just I don't want, maybe I didn't understand the question, or maybe I just want to ask just to make 100% sure. Someone I'm an I'm an agent in Ocean City. I mean, the property's in Ocean City. I'm a Baltimore City agent. I'm going to put a lockbox on the property that no one in Ocean City can utilize. Is that what's happening? Well, if we want an example of maybe, maybe not uh, representing your client's best interest, I no think one that can would get be in. a good example, <laughs> right? It would make it very right. difficult to show that no property. No showings today. <laughs> yeah. So that whoever asked that question, that was a good point. I, I was yeah. not aware of that. So thank you for that question. All right. Um, what do we have? We sell properties internationally, military families, corporate relo with access to so much technology. What exact knowledge will someone have that is local and more knowledgeable than one could research, look up, or make phone calls? Oh. So I guess what what would be local knowledge versus something you could just research on the on the internet? I I I I think to be fair, making phone calls and talking to people in the area, I think that's part of what what Kara had talked about. I think that really is what you should be doing if you are able to do that and and get yourself up to speed where you are competent and you know what's required in that jurisdiction. Um, I think that it is possible to do that. I guess the challenge that we're seeing is not everyone is doing that. Yeah, um, and um, also I wanted to mention 
point out the the use and access of the local board forms too. Right. I mean, Maryland's pretty um, pretty uh, unique as far as our you know our state compared to surrounding states of having the all these local all of our local boards and all, us with each of our local uh, jurisdictional addenda. Um, that, that, that detail different things about those areas. And even there, even areas within different counties have certain forms that you should use. So it's the knowledge of when and how and what forms to use and having access to them um, and to the updated versions too. I know that I just, I see old versions of forms flying around everywhere and it's, <laughs> Um, you know, when, when that's an example of knowing, knowing the area, knowing when something's updated, if there's a law, if there's legislation uh, related to, uh, to that county that's updated, those forms are then updated and you, you, that's something that's important to, uh, to be aware of. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just add to that point. I mean, uh, the comment of, you know, if you are able to sufficiently do the research and familiarize yourself and use the appropriate forms and educate yourself and be able to perform uh, to the level that's stated in Article 11, then, you know, that's great. But as one of the reasons that we're having the webinar today is that that's not happening. Uh, and if you can't, if you're not able to do the research, understand what the local disclosures are, understand what the requirements are, use the appropriate current forms, get up to speed on what's happening, you know, from a market perspective in that area, uh, then perhaps the better course of action is to refer. Yeah. And go there, be present. Right. <laughs> That's the other webinar. Go, we have don't go there. <laughs> That's <laughs> That's right. The real answer is go, go there. there. <laughs> go there. <laughs> Has anybody looked at the questions in the uh, chat? Um, scrolling through some of them. How can you how can you properly service a listing that is three hours away? Most of the homes uh, people don't live in the property; they too are three hours away. So th that's a good point as well. I mean, even geography um, does play a role in these situations. Yeah. A oh, one day one day showing codes or some discussion about one day codes. Kara, did you have any guidance or insight on that? Um, well, they to start with, they're either allowed or not allowed by your local board. Uh, you're going to have to check, confirm with your uh, your central lock agreement because um, I, I you know I, I know I know at least in our area that cover we have um, an association of several different counties or local boards in, in one agreement with CentraLock and we as that whole association do not allow them. Um, and it was for, you know, it was for certain reasons, but I know other local boards are, diff are, are different. Um, I would confirm what, Con confirm the ability to use them, the authorization uh, first with your local board and um, under what circumstances. Yeah. There's a lot, of, a lot of thoughts on the one day codes. Why would you give one to a buyer? <laughs> uh, another, I think someone had mentioned E&O. I think Kara had referred to E&O as well. Mm -hmm. And again, the, the real estate commission, I mean, has disciplined people for providing uh, one day codes to two people and not accompanying the buyer. Right. You know, yes, there's only circumstances that you're supposed to use them for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. If, even if they are allowed. Yeah. Right. right. But that varies, I guess, is my my point. Right. So I think the best the best advice would be, I mean, we, first you have to figure out what the rules are for that for that local board. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would just say, talk again, talk to your office manager, your broker, if you have any questions. Yes. Um, but the general guidance do not give, certainly don't give a buyer um, a code so they can see a property, you know, alone without being accompanied by the agent. Uh, anybody wanna um, uh, address the question? It says, isn't it true that during, since COVID it was allowed or even encouraged or supported via MLS to conduct virtual showings as a result of homes uh, being purchased via these virtual viewings. So anybody want to 
comment on that? Yeah, I can, I can comment from the uh, uh, MLS perspective. So we did uh, enable uh, the ability to, so within our rule set, you know, most of our rules and most of the industry was centered around an in-person world. Um, we changed our, our stance and our approach uh, as a result of COVID where uh, you can facilitate and, and we provide the mechanism to facilitate, you know, URLs or information about virtual showings, uh, especially for those areas that found themselves uh, under strict uh, orders and, and lockdowns and uh, and also be, to be responsive to consumers who uh, may not necessarily feel comfortable or safe visiting an in-person environment just yet, but they still need to address housing. So we do uh, provide for that within the MLS. Uh, like much of the industry, I think NAR provided some guidance as well that uh, encouraged MLSs to enable the ability to facilitate and capture uh, virtual showing, uh, whether it's URLs or, or other platforms. And we continue to do so today. Um, you know, with the given environment. And it's likely that that'll be an area that will continue. Um, that said, uh, and I'll uh, defer to Kalek, Kathleen, and Kara, um, just because you can do so, you still need to receive guidance from your broker, from your seller. I think Colette said earlier, uh, it's worth repeating again, a lot of this has to be arranged through the seller and seller's instructions uh, on, on what they want to allow and enable. But through the MLS, you can uh, uh, facilitate that. Uh, it comes down to your, your practice within the brokerage level and the seller's instructions. Yeah, I think it is important to remember that we are abiding by the lawful instructions of our client. Um, that was a good point. Yeah, that's, um, I would just add to that too. Hopefully everybody is using, if you, you are um, working with a buyer uh, who has never actually seen the property in person, um, you want to make sure that you're incorporating in uh, your files for your buyer client, the buyer hold harmless agreement, uh, so that if it turns out after the fact, after the buyer purchases the property sight unseen, uh, that there's some issues with it, it's not suitable for their purposes, they don't then, you know, try to come after you. So just a note to keep in mind that the buyer hold harmless agreement is out there to facilitate uh, those types of situations. I'm, I'm gonna uh, raise, ask one question that's in the um, uh, the chat. It's Renee, this is probably more of a policy thing for you. I'm not sure that, you know, we can come, you're not gonna be able to answer this today, but there's a suggestion really, why can't Bright change who can see what areas of Bright? Um, if you're a member of a particular board or maybe jurisdiction, I guess, you would only have access to those locations. So I guess if, you know, New Jersey agents can see properties in Deep Creek Lake, does that, does that make sense or should it be more limited? Yeah, so, um, so again, we said, I think the question was, uh, you know, can the MLS enable, uh, you know, Kara, if she's only based in um, Bethesda, for example, should we limit her ability to only see Bethesda listings? Um, that's not, our system isn't set up that way. Um, you know, again, we we mirror a lot of star participation rule license in the state. Um, uh, Kara has the ability to sell uh, throughout the state. Um, one of the things I think uh, might be worth a follow up discussion is, you know, can Kara uh, or other subscribers sell property in a neighboring town? Uh, how far away is three hours away too far? Um, how can you become competent and knowledge and, and practice in that area? Uh, I know in the legal profession, there's very clear guidelines on how someone through study, through par partnering with a more seasoned lawyer, um, can we put some guidelines in place there? Because the same standards would apply likely to a new agent, right? So does that mean we could never have new agents coming coming on board because they're, they're, they're not knowledgeable at the, at the get-go in that area? So the demand that we've heard has been to increase access to data and then trust in the brokers to know that they can make the appropriate decisions for themselves and their clients uh, once they view the applicable data. But we've all, we're also starting to see that by having wider access to data within the platform, uh, subscribers can enter into uh, referral agreements, uh, send their clients over to another state um, and the like. So we're actually seeing demand to increase availability to data rather than to go back and, and fracture or segment visibility only to a certain area. Keep in mind the consumers, uh, they currently likely you know, have access to, to wider data sets. And that's where we're trying to position our subscribers as well to have wider availability to data so that when a consumer calls them, uh, you know, they can just log into the MLS, pull up the listing information, reach out to the, to the listing broker and transact from there. 
Yeah, I mean, as as brokers and managers, we have we have a duty to provide reasonable and adequate supervision. And I I I don't see that restricting data is good for um, is good for the business. But we do need to um, uh, you know we do need to use our our managers, our brokers as resources. And um, and I see that you know the the push for the professionalism is. Um, because kind of supports that that whole idea too, uh, so I think that's that's more of the avenue that that we should head towards. There was one question asked. I I, I closed that window, so I don't remember exactly the exact wording. But basically, I guess there are some business models or some apps maybe that provide access to a buyer through the app. Where any I guess if the buyer is close by, there's through the phone or whatever it is, the buyer would have access to that property, even if they're not accompanied by an agent. Sort of you know. 24 seven access to a property and and was that a good idea um, I just off the top of my head I know Kara you've alluded to your eO carrier a couple of times um, if I were the listing agent on that property before I did that I would contact my eO carrier and see what their recommendations were or their guidance on the advisability of having an app that allowed someone to access the property well, or whatever the whatever the parameters yeah, are, I would right. probably, you know, first. And um, if that's what if 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 the seller's going to allow something like that, then you're absolutely going to want to have the updated lockbox addendum signed, right? Because that was the latest change to that one, authorizing or um, authorize the, with the seller acknowledging that it, if, if they're using their own method or if they're providing their own codes or using their own lockboxes as a means to get in, um, there was a little disclaimer, I think, on the added to the lockbox addendum. Yeah. Right. There's a new paragraph, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's just something just to be mindful of. And, and again, if you're the agent, definitely talk to your broker about that. Um, uh, you want to do what, you know, you have to talk to your seller, of course, as well. You're going to do what your seller wants you to do, and you won't do what your seller doesn't authorize. Um, but also on that one specifically, I would definitely make sure to talk to the E&O agent, because I think they might have, they might have some concerns. Yeah. All right. Got any, do we have more questions? We're getting close to the end of our time. Yeah, we are. All right. Everybody, Colette, pick, pick one last question, Colette. Um, it's a lot of comments. I'm not, I think we kind of covered most of the questions. There's a lot of comments, so hopefully we did cover all the questions I'm trying to flip through. Yeah, I don't see. You guys can chime in. Do you see anything, Kathleen? I'm just going to say squatters moving into empty homes, and I don't even, <laughs> I don't even want to talk about that. <laughs> um, squatters. Is that the, yeah, is that the, the Q a or the? Don't chat? go there. <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> Thank you. Did James? Somebody? James had a question. I had didn't see that. James. James Bacco had a question. I must have missed it. Oh, Jane said, I, he, my question hasn't been answered. Um, was this one, how do memberships to the local associations affect requirement to provide access and compensation? Um, I'm not sure about the compensation part. I mean, we touched on the access, but I'm not sure what that the compensation part of that means. Yeah, I'm trying to scroll and find this question, but I'm not seeing it, but. Uh, oh. Actually, you know what? I think it's for you, Renee. So wh why not make all MLS systems under the supervision of local boards and not a regional system? Yeah, and, and I think that's where, you know, we started right in our history with, with Brian and, and, you know, we, we expanded to the regional model. Um, great question. There's a lot of efficiencies by, uh, we reach by maintaining a, a regional MLS, wider access to data, um, increasing transparency to consumer. The consumer benefits, the subscriber benefits are certainly huge. Um, you're not siloed within uh, a certain practice area. If you're licensed in a state um, across our footprint, you have access to that MLS information. Otherwise, you would, you would go back to, you know, 42 associations in our, 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 in our footprint as part of Bright MLS. You would have to maintain 42 different uh, memberships in order to gain access to that limited subset of information. Um, so we see the trend. I think 
uh, about 10, 12 years ago, uh, across the country, there were about 1,100 MLSs. We're down to about 550. And so we continue to see that trend based on, on subscriber demand and the benefits to consumers to um, you know, open up that access to data. And oftentimes it's through the efficiencies gained uh, through regionalizing MLSs, and, and which is where we're at today. I think I lied. I do have one more question. I think Melissa Cooper had asked a question. Um, is there a way to see what association an agent is affiliated with? I've had showing appointments using Central Lock, but the app says I don't have access since I'm a member of a different association. I'm a member of the Coastal Association and I've had issues in Dorchester, which I think is that Midshore. So I don't, I, is that a, that's a bright MLS question? So I bet we're working on, on bringing in NERDS data uh, that would give us you know uh, real-time information on, on the association. Uh, in the interim, you, you could also uh, go to NAR's website through through their uh, member records and you can look up uh, the agent's name and it'll tell you what, what their primary association is as well through uh, NAR's website. I think they're uh, the old NERDS system uh, rebranded as M M1. Yeah. Okay. You can also search agent roster and you get some information there. Okay. Uh, In that's good. All right. We are at two o'clock. Is Dan, are you? Uh... I am here. You guys have been just pounding out the answers. This has been great. Um, <clears throat> and a great topic too. We had a lot of people here. So, uh, and look, there was a call in for another question, but we'll just have to wait for them. Um, but uh, uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, I do want to let everybody know that uh, we will be sending out the slide deck and a re video recording of this webinar likely next week when um, uh, we have those materials ready for you. So look for that in the email. I also would like to remind you of January 27th, uh, our next webinar. And it's really about taking leadership to the next level. So if anybody out there has an interest in serving on NER com committees, councils, task force, we're going to assemble a, a team of experts at Maryland Realtors to help you uh, begin to navigate that course. So thank you for attending today. Uh, look for the materials in the email. And thank you for our wonderful guests, Carol Williams, Renee Galicia, and of course, our colleagues, Kathleen D'Artez and Colette Massengill. Have a great day. And thank you. Thank you. All. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.